So the first sermon that I ever preached was a sermon on Micah chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. And I was preaching on what it means to truly worship the Lord. I still have my notes from that sermon. And I tried to go back and find the video, and I couldn't find it. But praise God that I could not find that video. Because even reading my notes made me cringe a little bit. I was like, man. Like, it wasn't the, like, it wasn't like inaccurate, but it was just the way that I worded it. Was, that was terrible. Why would you say it in that way? And I remember preaching that sermon. I, I, was, at a, uh, I was at the first church that I had served at. Uh, I was a youth pastor at the time, and it was my first time preaching in the main service. And I remember how nervous I was. I was so anxious about this. I wanted to make sure that every detail was correct. I wanted to make sure I didn't say anything wrong, that everything was perfect. And that's just the, the, the content of the sermon. You also have the delivery of the sermon to worry about. And that's where I really shined, right? I mean that ironically. I did not shine in my delivery I had a lot of nervous habits. I've gotten over, I think, most of them. But I used to, I was constantly playing with my ring. Like, I'd walk around the stage, and I'm just I'm doing this. Or I'd have a water bottle that I I'm, I'm don't, don't realize, but I'm just crinkling the water bottle the whole time. All these things that were really distracting. Uh, I couldn't stop saying the word, um. I said it the whole time. And after that first sermon, let me tell you that that church was not as gracious as many of you. Because even at our previous church, when I preached my first sermon there, I know some of you have talked to me about it, and you've said, man, you've come a long way. But I remember that day, and I only got positive feedback from you guys. You guys were very gracious to me. At my first church, though, man, they were brutal after that sermon. I'm not exaggerating. Like every single person, I swear, was telling me how distracting it was and how hard it was to listen to me because I was doing this or that. And this wasn't immediately after, but at one point later on, somebody actually said they would pay for me to go somewhere else and learn how to preach. I know, I'm not making this up. They were brutal. Now, I, they did have to sit through that sermon. Like I said, many of you were there at my, my, at my first sermon at our previous church. You know that there was some habits I was still working to kick Pastor Brian told me that at that sermon, he counted 60 or 70 times that I said the word right, that I just kept saying it. There's another pastor, he passed away last year, his name's Tim Keller. And I know some people have mixed opinions on him, and that's okay, I'm not talking about any of that, but he was a pastor. He was also a gifted communicator. And one of the things that he said is that every pastor needs to accept that their first 50 sermons won't be very good. And he says that it takes at least that long, at least that many weeks of consecutive preparing and preaching to, to build habits, to kind of get in to your rhythm. I'm not there yet. <laughs> but the Apostle Peter did not need 50 sermons. His first sermon was outstanding. And today we're going to be in Acts chapter 2, verses 14 through 41, and it's there that we find Peter's first sermon, the first sermon ever preached to the church. We see the birth of the church in this passage. Peter's first sermon went substantially better than mine did, or any of my other sermons for that matter. 3,000 people on that day of Pentecost heard Peter preach, and they came to Jesus, and the church was born. Today, we're going to dissect Peter's first sermon. Right, what was the message of Peter's sermon, and how does it affect the message that we proclaim today? And I think it's helpful for us to divide Peter's sermon up into three separate parts. So first, there's going to be an explanation, then there's going to be a proclamation, and an application. And I think framing Peter's sermon in this way is going to help us understand just the rich theology that is packed in there. But, but also the practi practical significance and, and, and really how it should shape the way that we preach the gospel today as well. So turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 2. So Acts chapter 2, and we're going to start in verse 14 and read through verse 21. But Peter, standing with the eleven, 
lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen is correct. Last week we saw... Uh, that, that Pentecost so far had gotten pretty wild. There was a violent storm that came through this house. The, the tongues of fire appeared and rested on the apostles and the 120 believers. And then they start speaking in all these different languages that they have no business knowing. And it's only 9 a.m. A lot has happened by that time of the day. But each of those miraculous occurrences, we said, were signs that God was at work that he was fulfilling promises he had made to his people. The Spirit had now come in fullness and power, and there was a range of reactions to that. Some were curious, some were perplexed or confused, and they're saying, hey, what's going on? Why are these Galileans, why are they speaking all these languages? And then you had others who were heart of heart, saying, hey, no, they're drunk, don't listen to them, they're just babbling, they don't know what they're, what they're talking about accusing the followers of Jesus of getting a little too crazy in their Pentecost celebrations. But now Peter stands up on behalf of all 120, and he offers an explanation about what is really happening. What is actually going on here? Peter says, some of you say that we're drunk, but it's only the third hour of the day, 9 a.m. And the third hour of the day, that was generally an a, a hour devoted to prayer by faithful Jews, and most wouldn't even eat breakfast until after that hour had passed. So Peter's saying, hey, guys, it's only 9 a.m. We haven't even had breakfast yet. We definitely are not drunk. So if they're not drunk, what is the explanation? Peter says, men of Judea, give ear to my words. In other words, he's saying, guys, listen very, very carefully. Because what I'm about to tell you is important. What you have just seen, all of the tongues and, and, and all of this other stuff, what you've just seen... This is exactly what God said he was going to do through the prophet Joel. And Peter goes on to quote from the book of Joel. But before we consider how Peter is using this, applying this, this prophecy to Pentecost, we need to step back and look at the prophecy in the book of Joel. Right? As you guys study God's word and you come to uh, a quote of the Old Testament in the New Testament, it's helpful to go back and look at the original context so you can better grasp how that quote is being used and applied in the New Testament. So the prophet Joel, he was prophesying about a coming judgment on the people of Judah. And he uses this imagery of this massive swarm of locusts that kind of sweeps through and they just devastate the land. They eat everything and leave it broken and destitute. And he's using that imagery to describe an enemy army an army that would come in, invade, and conquer the people of Judah. And so Joel, like many of the prophets, says, Judah, repent of your sins. Repent, and maybe God will stay this judgment. The passage that Peter quotes in Acts 2 is not talking specifically about that judgment, but it's looking forward to a time after that judgment, after those nations have come through and conquered, a time where God would heal his land, heal his people, and pour out his spirit upon them. God's people, it says, would be filled with his spirit, and they would prophesy and see visions and dream dreams. And then it says, before the day of the Lord, which the day of the Lord is like the final day of judgment, the last day when God judges all people. 
The New Testament shows us that the day of the Lord happens at the second coming of Jesus. So before that day, before Jesus comes back, before the day of the Lord, there would be all these wonders in the sky with the, the, the sun being darkened, the moon would turn to blood. But at this time, anyone who would repent and call on the name of the Lord would be saved. Now, if we were to turn in our Bibles, we're not going to do that today, but if we were to turn in our Bibles to Joel chapter 2, you'd notice a, a few small differences between what Peter says and what Joel said. Joel doesn't use the phrase, the last days. Joel says, afterwards, after this period of judgment that he's prophesied about, then the Spirit will come on or come to God's people, but before the day of the Lord. You see, in the Old Testament, the prophets were anticipating a new era, an era where God would come in and he would complete his work of salvation. And that new era is often associated with the work of the Holy Spirit. So what Peter's doing, the reason he changes the language here is he's clarifying. He's saying the coming of the Spirit, which has just happened at Pentecost, it marks, or it's a signal that that new era is here. It's begun. It is in full swing now. So it means that we have entered into the last days or the end times. Now, when we talk about end times, our minds usually jump to Revelation and the Antichrist, but the span covered by the end times, according to the biblical authors, is much, much broader than that. Uh, think of 1 Timothy, 2 Peter, James. They all tell us that we are in the end times. We are in the last days right now. The author of Hebrews he says God has spoken to us in many different ways through the prophets over many, many different years. But now, in these last days, he has spoken to us through his son. So the last days that Peter's mentioning here, that's the span of time between the first coming of Jesus and the second coming of Jesus. So basically, we are in the end game of God's plan for salvation. All that is needed for our salvation has been completed by Jesus. And the only thing we're waiting for now is his return. The day of the Lord, the second coming of Jesus. So Joel is locating the coming of the Spirit sometime during these last days, but before the very last day. And Peter clarifies that the coming of, Spirit, coming of the Spirit is right now. So that's the explanation he offers. The events that they've seen so far on this Pentecost day is that the Spirit has come. So that's the explanation portion of his sermon. The Spirit has come so the church can be a witness in the last days. The Spirit has come so the church can be a witness in the last days. Joel spoke of, of prophesying and visions and dreams, but that is not meant to be all-inclusive. Uh, it's not a description of every single believer's experience. I don't think we can say that no believer today is going to experience those things, but it certainly does not mean that all of us will experience these things because the larger point of this prophecy is the universality of the Spirit, the fact that his power is available to all of God's people. It's not that every single person will experience that, that power and that influence of the Spirit in the exact same way, just that the influence and the power and the coming of the Spirit is now available to all of us. Young and old, male and female, free and servant. The Spirit is a gift for all. And so it's very easy here to see how Peter could view these events as being fulfilled at Pentecost. Because this 120, this is made up of all different people. There are some young and some old. There are men and women. It's coming to all different kinds of people. But what about verses 19 and 20 then? The blood, the fire, the smoke, darkening of the sun, the moon, all these things. Were these fulfilled at Pentecost? Some would say yes, and they, have, they, they see some kind of figurative uh, fulfillment here. I, I don't see that. And I think if you pay close attention, verse 20 tells us these signs take place before the day of the Lord, before the very last day. So each of the signs in verse 20, they're associated with judgment. Judgment comes at the day of the Lord, the second coming of Jesus. So those signs, the ones that appear up in the sky with the sun and the moon, those are future to us. 
taking place just before Jesus returns. Now, while these last days will end in judgment, it's very clear as well that there is an escape from that judgment. Because in the last days, anyone, any person who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And the Jewish people listening, they would have understood, as they read Joel, they would have understood that to be a reference to Yahweh, to God the Father. But as Peter preaches, it becomes more and more clear that Jesus is Lord. And that it is the name of Jesus we must call on for our salvation. So this prophecy from the prophet Joel, it it was fulfilled at Pentecost, But church, in a sense, it is still being fulfilled today because we are in the last days. You and I are living in the end times. And church, the spirit is still being poured out. Joel was prophesying about us as well. Isn't that crazy? All those hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago, he was writing this, and we have a spot in that prophecy. Again, we may not prophesy and have visions, but the Spirit empowers our witness. We talked about this last week, the ways that the Spirit still works today. The Spirit works powerfully to transform us, to make us more and more like Jesus. He opens the way for us to proclaim the gospel to those around us so that other people can call on the name of of Jesus as well. Now, with that explanation out of the way, Peter's going to move on to kind of the heart, the meat of his sermon. So he's going to get to this, this proclamation portion, and it, and it kind of comes in two parts, and, and you're going to see Peter is trying to prove that Jesus is both Messiah and he is the Lord. So turn back to Acts chapter 2, and we'll read verses 22 through 28. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full in your, full of gladness with your presence." The Messiah was to be God's instrument of salvation. He was the one that would be sent to redeem his people, to establish the rule and the reign of God across every nation. This is the one that the Jewish people were waiting for. And according to Peter, he's telling this group of Jewish people, Jesus is the Messiah. He says, Jesus of Nazareth, this is the one that's the Messiah. And you should know this. Because you were there when he did all of these miraculous works. God did all these incredible signs and wonders right in front of all of you. This same crowd had witnessed them. And if they didn't, then they at least knew of Jesus' reputation. Everybody knew who Jesus was, and he was known as a man that did miracles. Uh, We know from, from historical writings that even his biggest detractors, they didn't deny that he did miracles. Many of them came to say, well, he was a magician, that he was simply a worker of signs, that he was tricking people or doing whatever, but but everybody knew his reputation. Jesus had the reputation of doing signs and wonders. These people knew Jesus. They knew what he did. And Peter said it was those works that God used to attest him, to demonstrate that he was the Messiah. So you have the Jewish people who who should have been waiting and waiting. They were waiting, and they were ready. They were patiently waiting for their Messiah, but finally he shows up. God shines a spotlight on him with all these different works and wonders, and it's like God saying, hey, here he is. 
Here's the one that you have been waiting for. And what did they do to him? Did they honor him? Did they worship him? They whipped him and mocked him and nailed him to a cross. But man, I love Peter here. He doesn't beat around the bush. But nowadays, we're, we're kind of afraid to talk about sin. We're afraid to talk about hell or to tell people, hey, you know what? Your actions are sinful. This doesn't align with what God has asked of us. Because we know that if we indicate in any way that we disagree with somebody, it'll be misconstrued as hatefulness or violence or something crazy like that. And so we try to dance around some of the weightier matters of the gospel. People are fine when we tell them, hey, God loves you, Jesus died for you, he, he wants a relationship with you. People are, people are cool with that. But the second you cross the line to say, but you need to repent and turn from your sin in order to follow him, then people start losing their minds. And they get so offended that you have the audacity to say the way that they're living is not in step with what God has asked. But God does call us to a standard of holiness. Peter just doesn't care, though. He gets right down to it. You killed him. You, men of Judea, you nailed him to a cross. The Messiah's blood is on your hands. Peter's got no problem calling sin for what it is. Church, we must not shy away from calling sin for what it is. What is wicked, we must call wicked because we help no one by allowing them to remain in their sin, by telling them, hey, you know what? It's okay if you want to walk in your sinfulness. And that goes for one another, and that goes for non-Christians as well. Now, we must be cautious in doing this. We must do it with the appropriate grace and gentleness and humility, but we can learn from Peter's boldness here. Now, at the same time that Peter acknowledges the human hand in the, the death of Jesus, he's also acknowledging the sovereignty of God. Jesus was delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. It had to happen. There was no other way. There was no deviating from God's plan. The death of Jesus had to happen because without it, there is no work of salvation. But isn't that incredible? Because God takes the, the single greatest act of human wickedness and, and turns it around and brings about the greatest blessing that humanity could ever receive. I mean, those of you who are experiencing hardship right now or mistreatment, be encouraged. Because if God can use the murder of Jesus for your good, he can and will use what you are currently experiencing for your good and his glory. Peter here is, is balancing the sovereignty of God and, and the free will and responsibility of man. We talked about this a lot as we studied through the book of Daniel, so I'm not going to belabor this conversation, but this certainly reinforces what we talked about in Daniel. The whole Bible, both Testaments, paint God's sovereignty and human will as two coexisting truths. They do not contradict. They don't take away from each other. Both are laid out as true. And because God's word lays them out as true, we should accept both as true. So often in the church, we insist, you know, it's got to be one or the other. Humans can make real choices, or God can be sovereign, but you can't have both. I disagree. The Bible says you can have both. So there's no reason for this to be a, a source of tension among us. Let us simply accept what God says. God is sovereign, and we make real decisions that we are responsible for. So God sovereignly planned that his Messiah would be killed at the hands uh, of sinful and wicked men. But we know the end of the story, don't we? He did not stay dead. God raised him up three days later, loosing the pangs of death. And, and it's interesting, Peter uses uh, language here that really refers to childbirth. But it kind of makes sense. Once, once a woman goes into labor, 
You can't really stop that process, can you? Like, there's no pause button. Man, how many of you and your wife went into labor, you said, honey, I'm really busy. Can we, can we push this off to next week? If you haven't had kids yet, man, I would not recommend that. Because once that baby is, is ready, it's not stopping. And it would also be stupid because you'll probably get punched in the face by your angry wife who's having contractions. But I think what Peter's saying is death could no more stop Jesus from being raised than a woman in labor can stop her child from being born. Jesus is the Messiah, God's instrument of salvation, and Jesus rose from the dead. But just like he did in his first section, in the explanation section, Peter again looks to the Old Testament to solidify this claim. So he turns to Psalm 16. And Psalm 16 is a psalm of King David, one that expresses a hope and a confidence in the strength and security of God. And in this psalm, he talks about, you know, those who run after other gods that worship idols, they're going to be let down, but not me. Not me, because I am safe in the arms of God. The Lord is at my right hand. He is my strength. He is my help. David even goes on to say, he will deliver me from death. I'm going to experience gladness in the presence of God. I won't see corruption. I won't be abandoned to Hades. I will be in the presence of God with joy in my heart. Now, what Peter's going to show us is that this psalm was not chiefly about David, though. It is ultimately about the Messiah. Look back at the text with me, verses 29 through 36. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. So David's tomb was a very well-known location. Every single Jewish person knew exactly where David's throne, or not throne, rather, David's tomb was. It was on a hill on the southern side of Jerusalem. And there's actually some pretty cool stories about some people trying to rob the grave and some things that happened there, but I don't have time to talk about that. So you can ask me after if you'd like. But everybody knew where this was. Even uh, Herod even constructed this big marble pillar or monument there to mark the location of David's tomb. And so Peter says, hey, all of us know where David is buried. Every single one of us. And he's saying because of that, we know that this psalm is not about King David because his tomb is undisturbed. David's body, his corpse, is still sitting in that same tomb. But David was a prophet, he says. And David, more than anyone, knew about God's promise. God's promise to set one of his descendants on the throne forever. One of David's descendants would be the Messiah. So knowing this, David wrote about the Messiah. This psalm couldn't possibly be about just David because David is dead. His body saw corruption. It's rotting in that tomb. But Jesus was not abandoned to Hades. Jesus' body is no longer in his tomb. So essentially, Peter's argument is this. David prophesied that the Messiah would be raised from the dead. God raised Jesus from the dead. Therefore, Jesus is the Messiah. And the apostles, he says, were witnesses. All of us are witnesses to the resurrection. 
They saw the resurrected Jesus. But now this whole crowd, this crowd at Pentecost, they've also become a witness. Now the crowd wasn't a direct witness to the resurrection. But what they have seen is proof that not only is Jesus the Messiah, but he has also been exalted as Lord. This is the second half of Peter's proclamation. First, Jesus is the resurrected Messiah. And second, Jesus is exalted as Lord. And Peter says that because the Holy Spirit comes from the Father. Luke 24, Jesus tells his disciples, I will send the promise of my Father. In Acts 1, Jesus told the disciples to wait on the promise of the Father. But the fact that the Holy Spirit comes means that Jesus has now ascended to be with the Father from whom he received the authority to keep his promise, to pour out the Holy Spirit on his followers. So the arrival of the Holy Spirit, which this crowd has just seen, demonstrates the exaltation of Jesus as Lord. Demonstrates that he has taken his place at the right hand of the Father and received the authority that rightly belongs to him. And again, Peter turns to the Old Testament, this time to Psalm 110. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your, enemy, make your enemies your footstool. Jesus himself quotes this in, in the Gospels. And he explains there that this doesn't speak about David, but one greater than David, to a Messiah. And Peter is continuing Jesus' line of thought here. This psalm was predicting what the crowd is now seeing, that the Messiah would be exalted as Lord. And he reiterates that in verse 36. That's, that's the heart of this sermon and proclamation. Jesus is the resurrected Messiah and exalted Lord. That is the message, the, whole, the, the core of Peter's very first sermon. And that is the message we proclaim today as well. We proclaim the crucified and risen Christ. We proclaim that Christ is exalted as Lord over everything. That he is the rightful king, that everything belongs to him and him alone. This must be the heart of our proclamation all of it must center on Jesus. It's because Jesus was raised that we too will be raised. Psalm 16 was in a way still about, about David, but also a little bit about us as well. It was chiefly about Jesus. He was the first one who would not see corruption. He was the first one that would be raised into the presence of God. But then, through Jesus, all of us will experience that same resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says that Jesus' resurrection is the first fruits of many more to come. It's a promise that, that we also will be resurrected as Jesus. So Jesus, as the resurrected Messiah, is vital to the gospel message, and it is equally vital that he is exalted as Lord. Psalm 110 initially spoke about the, the enthronement of a Davidic king, one who is set on the throne as a representative of God to his people. But Peter says its true fulfillment did not come with David or any other king because none of them are sitting at the right hand of the Father. Jesus is the Davidic king, the Messiah, the one who has ascended and now sits at the right hand of the Father, and he has been given the authority to pour out the Spirit on his people and to mediate all of the blessings of God. The last verse that Peter quoted from Joel 2 so that anyone who calls on the name of the Lord would be saved. And I said, this was originally understood as a reference to the Father, to Yahweh. But we see here, this is actually a reference to Jesus because he has been exalted as Lord. Jesus is the only hope of salvation. It is calling on his name that we find forgiveness of sins and eternal life. We must call upon the resurrected Messiah and exalted Lord Jesus. So Jesus is Lord and Christ. He was killed by his own people, but then he was raised to life and exalted to the side of the Father. And now he pours the Spirit out on us. That's the proclamation. Now there's only one thing left for Peter to do. Apply it. To call the crowd 
to repentance. Look at the last few verses here. Acts 2, 37 through 41. <clears throat> now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. That's some sermon. 3,000. When I was uh, in middle school, I think I was probably sixth or seventh grade, I, I didn't play golf regularly, but I got into like a few weeks there where I was like, man, I really want to play golf. So I would go out in the front yard and I would use my dad's clubs and I would practice my swing. And uh, one day I decided, hey, I want to actually like hit some golf balls. And so I'm walking around and I, I don't know how to swing a golf ball. I can't hit the ball very far. Like I, I smack the thing as hard as I can and I swear it goes like 30 feet. So I'm like, all right, this is fine. We got a big yard. So I put the ball down and I get ready and, and I hit this thing so clean. This thing just took off. And I see it kind of rise up over the neighbor's house and I kind of lose sight. But then I just hear a thump. And I could tell immediately that was the sound of a golf ball smacking a car. Second I heard that, so that, that sound, my whole body was, just went stiff, like, oh, man. I wasn't supposed to be doing this. <laughs> what have I done? And, and I was terrified because I, I didn't know what was going to happen, and it, it didn't go well for me, but I won't get into all that. But there was that spike of fear, that spike of guilt, because I knew I messed up. I made a mistake here. As Peter speaks, it's this kind of realization of guilt that, that washes over the crowd. You ever have that, that moment where you recognize your sin or your guilt, like hits you like a truck, like the spirit is just punching you in the soul? That's what the crowd feels right now. Because some of this crowd, they were the ones screaming, crucify him. Some of these same people. But now they're cut to the heart. They realize what they've done who they delivered up to be crucified. And they don't know what to do, so they say, Peter, what do we do now? How do we fix what we've done? And this heart language, I think it emphasizes how deeply this crowd believes what Peter has preached. They are convinced by what Peter has said. And so Peter explains that the only appropriate response is to repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins and receive the Holy Spirit. That's the application of Peter's sermon. Repent and call upon the name of Jesus. Call on the name of the Lord Jesus. To repent means that we recognize our sin, that we, we turn away from it, and, and then instead we turn towards God and embrace the forgiveness and mercy he offers so it means we're going this way with our sin, but we leave it over here and we do a 180 and we start walking this way, the way that God has called us to walk. It's not just a saying, oh, I'm sorry, God, and then continuing to go on your merry way and do all the sinful things you did before. It is an I'm sorry, God, I confess my sin, but there is a, a heart change and a change of direction so that you start walking toward and with God. In this instance, Peter is calling the crowd to repent turn from their rejection of Jesus as Messiah and instead call upon him as Lord and be saved. Now I'm talking to a room primarily of Christians. So I think for us, this is a helpful reminder too because many of you have done that. You've called upon the name of the Lord but you know very well that once you come to Jesus, you don't immediately stop sinning. And some of you even now may be stuck in, in a habit of sin, something that's eating you from the inside and you feel so guilty over it. Brother or sister, turn from that sin. Whatever you need to do to cut that out of your life and go the other direction, do that. 
Go, repent of that, and and walk to and with Jesus. There's a connection here between repentance and, and baptism. It says repentance and baptism leading to the forgiveness of sins. And this has caused quite a bit of confusion for some. Because some have sought to use this to say, hey, well, well, see, baptism saves us. You have to repent and be baptized in order to receive the forgiveness of sins. But that is a misunderstanding of what's going on here, and it ignores the clear pattern of the book of Acts and the rest of the New Testament. Next week in Acts 3, you'll see Peter heal a man, and he will tell that man, repent and turn back so that you can be forgiven. He doesn't say, repent and turn back, and then you can be baptized, and then you can be forgiven. For the forgiveness is tied to repentance. Our repentance is what cleanses us from our sin. Baptism, then, it symbolizes that cleansing, that, that, that turning from sin and to God. It does not save us. It is a public testimony of the work that God has already done within us, the work he has done to cleanse us. So it's not needed for salvation. It is, however, a command. And it is the natural next step for one who has turned to and called upon the name of Jesus. We have a couple of people uh, ready to be baptized. We're waiting for a a nice day and to get our pool fixed because I think the last one put our uh, our kiddie pool under. There's too many holes in it. We had like eight pounds of duct tape on that. So we're going to get a new pool so that we can have another baptism service outside. But I want to encourage you, if you are following Jesus but you have never been baptized, I have to ask, why is that? And I want to encourage you to be obedient to our Lord and to be baptized. And if that's something you would like to do, you can come talk with me, you can talk with any of the other elders. So Peter says, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins and receive the Spirit. Peter clarifies here that the promise of the Spirit prophesied in Joel, poured out at Pentecost, was not only for the 120 people who were speaking in tongues. It was for all of God's people. Peter says it's for you, it's for your children, for all the people who are far off. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord is saved and receives the gift of the Spirit. When you trust in Jesus, your sins are forgiven and the Spirit is indwells you and takes up residence within you so that you can walk faithfully with the Lord. Luke tells us that there were were many other things that Peter says. I wish we could have heard them, but he did not include them. He just gave us the the, the main points, I think. But he tells him uh, with one final plea, save yourself from this crooked generation. Save yourselves from a world that is under Judgment, turn and call on the resurrected Messiah and exalted Lord Jesus. And that day, 3,000 people, 3,000 believed and were baptized. The very first Christian sermon grew the church from about 120 to about 3,000. In a single day, 3,000 received his word and were baptized. But what I want to to highlight here is is that their belief was not a result of the tongues that they saw. We talked about this last week. The tongues helped prepare them for the gospel message they would hear, but it was because they received the word of God. They believed, they, they were convinced by the truth of God's word spoken through Peter. And so they responded to the faithful preaching of the gospel. The first sermon that was so, so effective, it reminds us of our primary task. It shows us how we ought to carry out that task effectively. You guys, the Spirit doesn't need tongues to make the gospel effective. Each one of us here who has trusted in Jesus is tangible proof of that. The Spirit is very much at work through the preaching of the gospel. If he wasn't, we would not be here. So we may never see 3,000 people come to Jesus at one time. That'd be crazy. I hope that happens at some point. But even if we don't, that's okay. There are many places in the world right now where people are coming to Jesus in droves, in massive numbers. But our job is not to sway hearts. 
That is the job and the work of the Holy Spirit. My job, your job, is to faithfully proclaim the message of the gospel. Peter said in verse 39 that the promise of the Spirit and salvation are for those whom God calls to himself. It is not our responsibility to convict, but our responsibility is to be a witness that effectively and faithfully communicates the gospel. Our job is to tell the world that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the only avenue of salvation. He came, he paid the penalty for our sins, and he is Lord. God has given him all authority. The Father has given him all authority. He has the authority to forgive anyone who calls upon his name. So our job is to call those around us to recognize that they are a part of this crooked generation, the generation that is perishing, that is under the wrath and judgment of God, and urge them to believe and repent and be forgiven so that they too can be transformed by the Spirit as we have. But church, this means we can't shy away from that responsibility. We can't shy away from teaching the hard parts of the gospel. If we fail to preach humanity's desperate need for forgiveness and a savior, we are not preaching the gospel. We help no one if we preach only about the love and mercy of God without also preaching about the reality of his judgment and then urging people to repent just as Peter does here. And can we do that with the utmost humility and gentleness, but we must have the boldness of Peter. This crowd heard and received the gospel after seeing the presence of the Spirit in their midst, in the midst of the 120. And so I would say in the same way, if we want people to take our message seriously, the Spirit must be on full display in our midst. Church, if we don't look different than the ones we're calling to repentance, it should come as no surprise when it falls on deaf ears. But when there is clear evidence that the Spirit is true, He is real, and He is present, and He is transforming people in our midst, man, it gives the message of the gospel so much more weight and credibility in the eyes of the world. Now I want to end this afternoon by offering the same application that Peter offered, by encouraging anyone in here who has never trusted in Jesus to do so. Search your own heart. You know that you are sinful. It does not take long to know that all of us have made mistakes. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. And you are a sinner just as I am, just as everyone else in this room. And that sin separates you from God. Not only that, but it places you under his very real judgment and wrath. And so, friend, if you feel the convicting work of the Spirit, please don't ignore it. Jesus paid the penalty so that you would not have to. And he is calling you to follow him. Don't ignore that call. Turn from your sin. Call on the name of Jesus and you will be forgiven and you will receive the gift of the Spirit. You will enjoy the eternal life and fellowship with God that Jesus has made available to us. Heavenly Father, I thank you for our time this afternoon in the book of Acts. I thank you for such a powerful example of what it looks like to proclaim your word to proclaim the gospel. God, and I thank you that even today, all these years later, that the Spirit is still at work convicting and drawing people into relationship with you. And God, it is our prayer that if there is anyone in here that does not know you, Lord, would you please convict them. Let them, just as this crowd was, be cut to the heart, overwhelmed by the reality that they are sinful and they need a Savior. Lord, I pray that they would call on the name of Jesus and that they would embrace the free gift of salvation that you have offered to every one of us. And God, we end our time praising, praising the resurrected Messiah and the exalted Lord Jesus. Be honored in this final song. 
It's in the name of our Lord Jesus that we pray. Amen.